Hey, hey, chemistry, ready for another flipped lecture? We talked about rate laws as uh, mathematical expressions of how quickly a reaction progresses from reactants to products. But now we're going to complicate the issue a little bit because most reactions stop somewhere before the reaction is all the way done and they, um, the, the reaction starts to undo itself a little bit. And we'll talk about how that works in a little bit, but now we're talking about balance just like in the force, right? Anakin brought balance. No, just kidding. We don't believe in that. Uh, but the uh, the reaction going forward and now a reaction going backward can reach this point of balance and we have to be able to express that mathematically. So here we go talking about chemical equilibrium. Up until now, we've talked about reactions and we've assumed that they are irreversible and that they only go one direction. But react reactions can reverse themselves. Sometimes the products can turn back into reactants. And so reactions that are reversible can go in both directions. Um, and so reactants and products exist as mixtures. They, the reactants start to make products, and then at some point the products start to make reactants again. Um, the relative speed of those two reactions depends on lots of factors that we will unpack here for, for you. So um, there comes a point where the reactants are, are producing products at the same rate that products are producing reactants. And so we reach a point of dynamic equilibrium. We've used this phrase a bunch in science. And so um, that word means where it's not stopped, but it looks like it is because it's going both directions at the same speed. Okay, so it reaches that point of dynamic equilibrium where forward and reverse reactions are going at the same rate. And there is such a thing as the law of chemical equilibrium that states that a reaction at dynamic equilibrium has a constant ratio of reactants and products. So while reactions are still happening, the solution doesn't look like there's more reactions happening because it's being made and unmade at the same rate. Okay. So let me just show you some examples of this. Here we have an example where the forward rate of, rate of reaction slows down over time and the reverse rate of reaction speeds up over time. And then we reach this point of equilibrium here where the concentration of the reactions uh, are, are balanced and the reactions are happening at the same rate at the same time. Okay, this is another way of to get equilibrium where the reactants uh, start uh, making their products and the products start making reactants again and the reactants slow down in one direction and speed up another and then here we have an equilibrium where the products are much higher in concentration than the reactants are but notice the reactants didn't go to zero and the products didn't ever get quite as high as the reactants used to be so the reaction goes quite a, f a far bit in, um, in the forward direction, but it doesn't quite make it all the way there, right? So equilibrium comes when the forward and reverse reactions are, are balanced. They're both happening, but they're balanced. Here's an example where the reaction only goes a little ways. The reactants drop off in concentration, but then stabilize. And the products pick up in concentration a little bit and then stabilize. And here, the reaction doesn't go very far. The concentration of the reactants are always quite a lot larger than the concentration of the products. Okay, um, so we're talking about balance here. Equilibrium talks about how a forward reaction and a reverse reaction have reached this point of balance where the two reactions are happening at the same time. In this image, this example here, we would talk about balance being somewhere in the middle where the reactants and the products are at similar concentrations when equilibrium is reached. But that isn't always the case, right? Sometimes balance is reached far in one's direction or the other. So in this little silly example, we have a very large concentration of one thing and a very small concentration of something else. And it's still balanced, but, uh, but it's balanced heavily in one direction. Okay, So here's an example of, uh, of a, a cyanide molecule and iron um, forming iron cyanide. Um, and the reaction is reversible. It can go forward or it can go in reverse. And there's a, there's a point at which this reaction is happening at the same speed as this reaction. So it's found a point of dynamic equilibrium. Okay, reaction equi equilibrium constants. Now we're gonna try to express this concept mathematically. Rate laws for the forward and reverse reactions are um, compared to each other because at equilibrium, remember they equal each other. So the forward reaction rate equals the reverse reaction rate. 
And so we could set those two as uh, equal to each other at the point of equilibrium. And then we can actually rearrange that mathematically to express a new reaction constant. Remember, K serves as the mathematical expression of how many moles per second this thing is making, or the reaction is making. We can make a new one and use KEQ for the reaction uh, constant at equilibrium and express how fast the reaction is going uh, forward versus reverse and, and have, a, have a ratio expression um, where we can, we can see uh, if, it's, if it's favoring one direction or the other or if it's balanced. If you get a KEQ value that is greater than one, then it favors the forward reaction. And so the reaction has gone forward almost all the way and then found this point of balance. If it's under one, if it's a less than one, then it favors the reverse reaction where the reaction gets started and then hits equilibrium pretty quickly. Um, so it's favoring the reverse reaction. Okay, now, don't be scared. Here we go. Um, this is how you do this. So if we have a, a pretend chemical reaction, A plus B in equilibrium with C plus D, then the forward reaction rate, KF, forward reaction rate is the concentration of the products, sorry, the reactants. And the reverse reaction is the concentration of the products, right? Because remember, it's only the reactants that affect your rate law. So it's only the things going into the reaction that affect the rate law in the forward direction. And these are the things going into the reaction in the reverse direction, right? These are here. And so if the reaction is going reverse, these are the new reactants for the reverse reaction. Um, at equilibrium, the forward rate equals the reverse rate, so concentration of A times B is the concentration of C times D. So we can rearrange this mathematically to show that the, the forward concentration rate divided by the reverse concentration rate is the same as the reverse concentration rate law divided by the, sorry, the reverse concentration rate law divided by the forward concentration rate law. Okay, so in other words, we have the reverse rate law over the forward rate law. Now, you look at this and you say, but it says forward. How come it's not A and B? Um, when you rearrange this algebraically, you wind up flipping the, uh, the partners here just because you're dividing by both sides, right? So you wind up with KF over KR equals concentration of the products divided by concentration of the reactants. And we can call KF over KR KEQ, the equilibrium constant. Okay, so... If all the substances are not in the same phase, then um, then they don't affect the rate law, right? So if something settles out, it's a precipitate and it settles out a solution, or if it's a gas and it bubbles away, then we just make its concentration one so that it doesn't affect the math. Um, so, for example, in this reaction where solid uh, silver chloride goes into solution and is uh, and is dissolving, and we have aqueous silver ions and aqueous chlorine, then um, the, the forward reaction, the A and B, right, it's the, the forward reaction, the reactants, would be 1 because it's a solid. So we put a 1 there, and then we would just care about the reverse reaction, the C and D. So this means that the forward reaction doesn't actually affect the equilibrium constant. Okay. So just a, a quick picture, if we're looking at the reaction, just at an example of a reaction in equilibrium, we could have <coughs> these silver molecules um, reacting with these molecules here floating around in solution. But because they, they're precipitate, they're solid, and they're in a big chunk, notice all of these molecules underneath that don't get to react. This goes back to, um, to reaction rates and that surface area matters, right? This is why something that precipitates and clumps up and settles out of solution doesn't really affect the reverse direction or whatever direction it's involved in because it can't get there to the stuff to react. Okay, it's just a picture of that. So let's look at an example here. Uh, I'm going to come down here. Let's look at an example. For the reaction, nitrogen gas plus three moles of hydrogen gas is in equilibrium with ammonia as a gas. Determine the value of KEQ given the following data. So we let the reaction go. And then at equilibrium, we sample the reactions uh, system, and we find that there is 0 0.05 moles, uh, 0 0.05 molar concentration of nitrogen gas, 0 0.05 molar concentration of hydrogen gas, and a 50 molar concentration of ammonia. 
Well, you can see just from this that the reaction very much favors the forward reaction because at equilibrium, there's a whole truckload of this, the product, and just a little bit of the reactants. But let's figure out exactly what the relationship is, okay? So the reverse rate law over the forward rate law. Um, ammonia is the reactant of the reverse rate law. Um, and we're going to raise that to the second power because there's a 2 there for the coefficient. Um, and the concentration is molarity, 50 molarity, so 50 raised to the second power. And then the reverse, the forward rate law is the concentration of nitrogen times the concentration of hydrogen raised to the third power. Again, the 3 there becomes an exponent, right? 0 0.05 times 0 0.05 to the third power. So 50 to the uh, second power is 2,500. And 0 0.05 to the third power is 0 0.000125. <coughs> Multiply and then divide. So KEQ equals 400 million. So the reaction constant of equilibrium is 400 million. Now, keep in mind that anything greater than one favors the forward reaction. 400 million is a whole lot more than one. And so it grossly favors the forward reaction, and the reverse reaction only is happening as a trickle, but it is at equilibrium, okay? Last idea, Le Chatelier's principle. Le Chatelier's principle states that when a system at dynamic equilibrium is stressed, in other words, you, you tweak the system in some way, the point of equilibrium will move to relieve the stress. So the reaction has gone to a certain point, and then it reaches equilibrium, and then you do something to it, you can move the equilibrium point. So you can move it towards the products or towards the reactants. So changing concentrations or adding catalysts do not change the reaction equilibrium. And at first you're like, what, really? And the reason for that is because if, you, if the reaction finds a balance um, in a certain situation and it has made a ratio between the concentration of the products and the reactants, if you add more products or you add more reactants, you're going to force the reaction for a moment to go in one direction or another. But then it's just gonna find the same ratio of, of balance, of equilibrium balance. So if there's a reaction and the dynamic equilibrium point is 7 eighths of the way to completion, and then it finds dynamic equilibrium, if you dump more reactants in, it's gonna make more, more products, but then it will still find an, a dynamic equilibrium point at 7 eighths of the way done. It's just that both piles are bigger. Right? There's more products and there's more reactants, but the ratio is still 7 to 1. Okay? So adding concentrations or catalysts does not change KEQ. Only changes in pressure or heat actually change KEQ. Okay, So we're going to do some labs with this in a little bit, and this should help clarify what's going on. Here's just a picture. If I take hydrogen molecules and nitrogen molecules and I make ammonia, um, and here's the partial pressures, right? Um, at equilibrium, I could, I could increase the pressure, and this is more moles of gas than this is. So this takes up more volume than this does. So by increasing the pressure, I can force things into this direction. Um, also, if this is a, if this is a, um, a exothermic reaction, then by adding heat, I can drive it in a particular direction, right? So heat and pressure do affect KEQ, concentration and catalysts do not. And that is it. We'll do some labs, hopefully that clarifies everything. Um, let me know if you have any questions, you can put them in the comments field below and I'll get to them as quickly as I can or I'll see you in class tomorrow. Have a wonderful evening, God bless you. Jesus loves you and so do I.